Coming up, in 1967, the illustrious Summer of Love, a psychedelic sunshine pop standard hit number one on the US charts. But this song was cloaked in controversy. First of all, it was supposed to be a B-side. It was actually released as a B-side originally. Then it was found that the song was allegedly based off an instrumental idea from two of the band members who were never given credit. To this day, they still don't have songwriting credit. Uh, one of them would go on to help compose Sweet Home Alabama in Leonard Skinner. Sweet home. Every band member tried to sing the song, but it wasn't right. Amazingly, they were sung by a friend of the band. It was a 16-year-old kid who happened to be at the recording studio as a guest to watch him record. He walked up and recorded the song. Coming up next, we get the story from an interview with the co-founder of this mystery band on Professor of Rock. Hey, music junkies, Professor of Rock, always here to celebrate the greatest artists and the greatest songs of all time. You know, if you used to pour over the liner notes while you were listening to your records as you were growing up, you're gonna like this channel, dig this channel of deep musical nostalgia. Make sure to click on the bell. I mean, click the subscriber button first, the red button and then the bell. So you always know when our latest interviews come out and our latest videos, check us out on Patreon and our merch. That helps us keep it a daily channel. Well, it's time for another edition of our show, Bottle Lightning. We haven't done one of these in a while. Most call them one hit wonders. We call them Bottle Lightning, or that uh, band's one big song ruled the charts, but they weren't able to sustain long-term domination. Here's the deal. There are certain songs that when played are more effective than a time machine. Uh, they evoke the decade better than any other emotion or feeling outside of actually being there. Now, unfortunately, I never got a chance or I never got to experience the 60s. I was born in the decade after that. But as I was growing up, I got firsthand experience of growing up in that wondrous decade from my dad, my pop, who told me about all of his experiences coming of age in that time. Also, of course, done interviews with hundreds of artists who released life-changing music in that decade. So I've gotten that standpoint. I remember my dad telling me about several songs from the 60s that were so potent, so drenched in the sounds of that era, that it instantly took him back to that time. To him, Incense and Peppermints was one of those songs. A great slice of psychedelic sunshine pop and one of the first number one hits of that genre by a band with an equally groovy name, Strawberry Alarm Clock. Uh, the song went to number one in the summer of love and has lived on since then in pop culture. There's an interesting story uh, behind this song for sure was allegedly based off an instrumental idea by band members, keyboardist Mark Weitz and guitarist Ed King. Uh, God bless the late Ed King who passed away from cancer just a few years ago. Ed, of course, would go on to be a charter member of Leonard Skinner and create one of the greatest guitar riffs of all time. Mark Weitz and Ed King created the instrumental idea, only they didn't get any credit for it. It was officially credited to producer and A&R man John S. Carter and Tim Gilbert of the band The Rainy Days. At the very least, Whites has stated that he and Ed should have received a co-writing credit. I mean, if it came off an instrumental idea from them. Sadly, it's an oft-told story from the early days of rock and roll. Musicians not being fairly credited or compensated for that matter. <music> then their friend, uh, a 16 year old kid named Greg Munford, who was attending the recording sessions as a visitor, just to watch, because the band members had a hard time singing the lyrics that John S. Carter wrote. I had the opportunity to discuss this at length with co-founding member and keyboardist Mark Weitz, and he has the in-depth story of this classic song, along with some other fascinating facts. You're gonna love this one. You know, it's something I think about every now and again about one hit wonder status, the term one hit wonder. Um, it's always being debated. Does something qualify as a one hit wonder if it was the lone hit for an artist? Does it have to, uh, the second hit technically have to hit the top 40 or the top 10 to not be a one hit wonder? What if the band had a second top 40 song? A lot of questions out there about this. That's why I'd rather call these songs lightning in a bottle. Um, Strawberry Alarm Clock actually wasn't a one hit wonder. They had a second top 40 hit after Incense and Peppermint. A song called Tomorrow went to number 23. Tomorrow. Hasn't been as massive as uh, 
incense and peppermints, but uh, this band and this song is so indelibly tied to the 60s. It's one of a few songs, like I said, that absolutely defines the era. Here's the story of the number one smash from Mark. Now, as we go into this interview, I do want to thank our sponsor, Zenny Eyewear. And seriously, check out the glasses I wear. I love them. Go design your own. You can do a virtual try-on before you even buy to see how you look by clicking on the info button right up here. It'll actually take you there. You can design your own pair of glasses up to 80% off regular retail prices. Check it out today. Here's Mark with the story. <laughs> talk about like, really get into incense and peppermints. Mm -hmm. the album itself went to number 11 sold 250,000 mm -hmm. copies a masterpiece of psychedelia I mean it really was well thank you incense and peppermints yeah was a song that I remember as a kid my dad playing the 45 because he had the 45 that my parents had always played records as I was walking around the house and that would marinate in me so when I think of the 60s there are a couple of key songs for what it's worth is one of those songs that mm -hmm. like, this is must be what the 60s felt like. Children, what's that sound? Everybody look what's going down. Turn, turn, turns that way. It's the season, turn, turn. Incense of Peppermints is one of those songs. I feel like I'm like getting some kind of energy from the 60s. I don't know, it's just that sound, those vibrations. It's, it's, it's really amazing. It's stimulating, mind expanding, safer to use than alcohol. It's the in thing. No drugs. Tell me about that. Because a lot of people always say, oh, there's a drug song. We were as straight as an arrow in the studio. And <laughs> most of the time on stage, we were not a druggy band as people depicted us as. You know, on stage, our songs were complicated. We had to have all our faculties to play. <laughs> Plus, you're traveling. Did you ever try to have four hours of sleep and then do a three, three shows in a day? I yeah. mean, that's... You know, you don't want to sound lousy on stage. Who cares what games we choose? Little to win. The harmonies, the harmonies you guys came up with. Tell me about that. A new member of the band at the time, uh, a new drummer came in named Randy Seal. He helped us with the harmonies. And we, at the time, were involved with a vocal coach. Mm -hmm. His name was Howard Davis. He was the man behind our harmonies on the first, the second, and the third album. He would write these elaborate 40s and 50s kind of close harmonies together. Wow. Because that's the era he was from. He was a fantastic piano player. He was the guy that, uh, the harmonies that you hear, the rich harmonies, they took a lot of work. Some sessions we would do nothing but, we're, I mean, we, we'd rehearse ahead of time these harmonies and then go into the studio and it'd still be a, a tough go at it. We were not professional singers. Most of the guys in the band were 18 years old. So take some 18-year-old guys from a band that, that started in Burbank, California, and say, you're going to be a perfect harmony singer now. So we really, it, it was amazing that everybody rose to the occasion. I don't know how we did it. It was a lot of rehearsal before mm -hmm. the recording. You don't rehearse in the studio. Uh, four track was the standard in the industry at the time. Our engineer at the Original Sound Studios, his name was Paul Buff, he invented or designed a 10-track machine. Wow. And when we were recording, we thought it was an 8-track, but later on we found out it was a 10-track. There wasn't any 10-track machines around. The backstory is on this is that um, our producer never put out a stereo version of Incense and Peppermints. Wow. Uh, he said, no, nah, it's a 45. Nobody, makes, nobody buys stereo 45s. Everybody's got their little mono player. And to this day, there is no such thing as a stereo version of Incense and Peppermints. Really? Yeah, our number one hit. It uh, it it was recorded in mono uh, on a multi-track machine. When they mixed it down, it was in my. They never did a stereo mix on it, which was a big wow. mistake. But nevertheless, uh, our producer Frank Slay Jr. made that decision at the time for whatever reason. 
well, it came from an instrumental that you you wrote, and Ed came up with the bridge part, right, Ed King? Yeah, I had this idea, and I, I called Ed up on the phone. I said, Ed, I have this... this Which, this, let's throw it out there, Ed yeah. King later was in Leonard Skinner. Ed King joined yeah. Leonard Skinner, I believe it was 74, ended up writing uh, one of the major contributors to Sweet Home Alabama. Oh, yeah. And that famous lick at the beginning of the song, that's Ed. Ed was, Ed was great about, about helping me. Uh, I'd get stuck on a song. I said, Ed, I need you to come over. The four songs that actually charted on the top 100 billboard, uh, Ed helped me on when I, got, I would get stuck. And I said, yeah. Ed, get your butt over here. I've got another section. And somehow, I don't know how we did it, we just worked really great together. Ed was one of, the, one of those people that we never fought. We never had a mean word to say to each other. We yeah. always gelled. We finished the song, originally had four verses in it, and uh, it went down to three. It was running too long. It was into the four-minute range, and our yeah. producer said, we can't go over three minutes. Nothing is over three minutes right. in 45. Right, It ended up at 316, by the way, somewhere in there. But Ed helped me with the bridge, and we went in and recorded a instrumental, no lyrics. The intro, the verse, the bridge, the outro, the the major sevenths at the end of the song. Mm -hmm. It turned out to be the Shalalas at the yeah. end of the song. Our producer had another band or writers working in contract under him. Mm -hmm. They were in a band called The Rainy Days. They had a novelty song called Acapulco Gold, which uh, actually got LA airplay, but as soon as the disc jockeys figured out what Acapulco Gold was. They <laughs> yanked it off the air, and that yeah. was the end of that. John Carter and Tim Gilbert were the two writers, and Frank Slay sent him a reel-to-reel -reel of the instrumental version of Incense of Peppermints. It hadn't been called that yet. In fact, our manager called it the Happy Whistler. Really? I don't know where that came from, but that okay. was the working title. And which, of course, we hated, but that's yeah. besides the point. They wrote somehow, I don't know where the lyrics came from, but John Carter came up with the lyrics. He sent the reel-to-reel the -reel back, playing an acoustic guitar, singing, in sends peppermints, crippling mankind. You know, and we, uh, Frank Slay brought us to his office in Holly, on Hollywood Boulevard. We sat down. He put it up on the speakers, and we listened. And we listened to the whole song, and we said... Wow, where did he come up with those lyrics? Who cares what games we choose? Little to win, but nothing. You know, it was rebellious enough that first I said, wow, this is a great, you know, song. You can, there's like innuendo in it. There's, there's, a, you can think of it in a lot of, it had a lot of different meanings and, and, and you'd like to keep things that way. You know, yeah. you didn't, this means this. And, you know, the reason yeah. we said this. Lyrics, it just seemed to flow. The majority of us, like the lyrics, and we went into the studio. Uh, our producer said, well, here's the lyrics. Let's see who's going to sing this song. And we're right. all looking at each other. We went around, and everybody, they ran the track, and everybody tried to sing Incense and Peppermints. You know, there's the lyrics on the music stand. Next. You know, the next guy would come up. He'd sing. Next. We went around the whole room. And he goes, God, I just, nobody just sounds like right for this. Friend of ours and our, he had his own band mm -hmm. and he was trying to start a band. His name was Greg Munford, yep. M-U-N-F-O-R-D. Greg was sitting on, I think he was like 15 and a half years old. Yeah, or 15, 16, yeah. something like that. He was, you know, long hair, sitting on the ground, just listening to the, you know, being quiet, minding his own business, mm -hmm. sitting on the floor like a fly on the wall in the studio. He was watching everything. And we said, hey, Greg, why don't you get up there and try it? So there's, you know, the vocal mic right there. Greg gets up there. They do a pass. They run it. We play it back. We all look at each other. Greg sounds the best on this. <laughs> he's not even in the band. He's not even in the band. He's a, what are we going to do about this? You know, so we go, hey, Greg, you want to be in the band? <laughs> and he goes, no, I'm starting my own band. You know, it was like Crystal Circus or something like that. <laughs> colors of crystal colors or I can't remember the name, but we went ahead and used Greg's vocal track. We did the harmonies 
and uh, mixed it down. George had said that you guys had read somewhere. We're George is our bass British, player. Yeah, yeah. We're trying to do British accents. And when you were singing in sense, and that's what, what kind of got this. You know, the influence of British, of UK rock and, and, and um, the British invasion, it filtered in a little bit. Sometimes yeah. pronunciations, especially from the Beatles. You know, we'd love to talk like, I like to uh, introduce you to Apple Juice or Reg Slaw. You know, we tried to, you know, right, try right. to talk like John Lennon or Paul McCartney. They were idols of ours. You know, the movie Hard Day's Night. Love those movies. And 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 sometimes our, our, our lyrics would have a little English kind of like intonation to it here and there, yeah. although we were not trying to do an English accent. Right, We right. were just trying to color up the lyrics yeah. a little bit. You know that you have a song with staying power when it's had a resurgence so many different times, being used in Austin Powers. What did you think about that one? They're using Austin Powers. <sighs> That was uh, that was a big surprise. That was the one with Groovy Baby and all yeah. that. You know, uh, I I didn't even know that Incense of Peppermints was in that. I was actually in a theater watching it, and there's a crane shot in a disco. They start playing Incense of Peppermints. I had no idea. Really? Yeah, that that was going to be in there. So I was I was totally taken by surprise <laughs> on that. And you know, of course, you get on the phone. Hey, we're in. In Austin Powers, you know, yeah. they had to get clearance to, obviously, from the publishers on that yeah. to play that. But when you saw, you know, a hundred extras sitting there dancing to your song, that that was uh, a shot in the arm. That yeah. was great. And The Simpsons. Hol yeah, Homer, people Homer's hey, actually... did you guys know you're on The Simpsons, you know? <laughs> actually name checked when he's talking about medical marijuana yeah he's talking about it pops up here and there oh it you know, does that, yeah because yeah. the record sold a million copies it went gold went to number one on all the charts that was not an easy task back in those days there was no videos on mtv, MTV. Or yeah YouTube. There, was, there was no internet obviously but you had to literally go we were pounding California from from San Diego up to San Francisco every little small town we'd stop at every radio station we'd give a record we'd meet the disc jockey he'd play the song on a little 1000 or 5000 watt station which dotted up and down the coast and inland and uh, that's how you promoted a record back in yeah. those days wow. you it was very difficult to get on major uh, airplay in a in a large metropolitan area like Los Angeles or San Francisco or New York or you know, places like Dallas, Texas. And it was not easy to get on, you know, uh, radio airplay unless some, you had some help. It took six months to get that record to move up a chart. Wow. To the top 100. I mean, when we got and on. That's I six mean, we, months of meeting with the radio station. That's six stations. months of working hard. We had to push really hard on that record. It's not hitting the thing to go out to YouTube and waiting for it to kind of. Yeah. Nope. It yeah. was town by town and dance club by dance club. I mean, we played every little dive that you can book in. You know, Uni Records was, was very influential in, in getting that record, and especially Russ Regan, head of A&R at the time, which mm -hmm. took a big chance in signing our band onto the Uni label. We were in, I think, Santa Barbara. There was a radio station, KIST, 5,000-watt yeah. station out of Santa Barbara, California, our manager was uh, uh, friends with the main disc jockey there, Johnny Fairchild, which uh, yeah. on our first album, we dedicated the album to Johnny because he was the first one to put our songs on the air. And we got a lot of requests from the Santa Barbara area that uh, helped us move into the L.A. area. So I believe that that was it. And when we heard it on L.A. Airplay months down the road, it, we were screaming going down Sunset Boulevard, screaming <laughs> out the window, that's us, we're on the radio. I mean, we were screaming awesome. at the top here. We were like hoarse yeah. because we couldn't believe that we finally made it to LA Airplay, which was like, I mean, we, we were ready to die then. We we're going yeah. to heaven, we're done. You know, we made it. Thanks so much for watching. Leave us a comment about this psychedelic classic. What are some other bottle lightning songs you think we should cover on here? Uh, what do you think about this song? What are some other songs that define the 60s? 
And it's just such an interesting story behind this song. If you like our content, we invite you to subscribe below. We'd love to have you as part of our community here. We're keeping the music alive. That's what we're trying to do. Until next time, three chords and the truth, my friends. Talk to you soon.